Let me invite you to turn to Titus chapter 3. As we continue our series through this little letter. And we have a brief yet rich text this morning. I'm going to read all the way to verse 8 for context, though we'll focus simply on verses 1 and 2 for the sermon. So let's hear the word of the Lord. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Let's pray together. Father, we again thank you for your word as we gather around it this morning. We thank you that although, even as we've already discussed, that although we were once foolish and disobedient, led astray, enslaved by our passions, nonetheless, you have acted in the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem all those who have faith in him. And we thank you. So we ask by the Holy Spirit whom you've poured out upon your people, that you might speak to us this morning. Help us to see afresh this description of how we should live. Show us where we need to repent and where we need to grow, that we might faithfully reflect your glory. Be at work within us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, let me go ahead and address the elephant in the room. The sermon title I intended as a joke when I sent it to Zach earlier this week, and then I saw it was in the bulletin. I actually saw it later in the week when it was already in the final draft, and I thought, well, let it be. So there it is, and I have exhausted all my pop culture references that I have. But the language does fit this text quite well, fits this letter. It is telling us to live in a certain way. That's why, actually, a couple weeks ago, in the, towards the close of the sermon, uh, in Titus chapter 2, I made the statement that this is the way. Now, you understand how things work in your mind that you're about to say something and you can be thinking about it before you do. And as I was about to say that, I thought, this will sound like a quote from The Mandalorian. And I thought, fine. But the fact is, well before that show, I was saying this is the way because the Bible does. And that is much of what Paul is saying here. He is telling us there is a way of living that conforms to the gospel. You remember back there in chapter 1 when he was talking about the false teachers. And he says, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good deed. They claim to know God, but how they live shows it's not true. Chapter 2, verse 1. But you speak the things which are fitting to the gospel. 
there's a way of life which fits the gospel. So in chapter 2, 2, 1 to 10, he said, this is a portrait, not comprehensive, but a significant portrait of what it looks like to live in such a way that affirms rather than denies the gospel. Then 2, 11 to 14, here's a gospel summary that roots that living. And verse 15, teach this authoritatively. In chapter 3, he comes back and does the same thing again. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, this is the kind of living that fits the gospel. This is the way you live or walk if you really know God. Verses 3 to 7, another gospel summary that roots that kind of living. It's always in the Bible. Live this way because of what Christ has done. And then verse 8, another statement, teach this authoritatively. So chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, parallels 2, 1 to 15. And not that you care what's in much of the commentaries, but just for the fun of it, uh, many of them are taken up with wrestling. It seems like some of them may be pulling their hair out. Why does Paul go and do the same thing again? I find myself a little tickled with it and say, I'm not here asking why he did it. I just want to know what he said. Do you ever wonder if your parents, you know, why did I bother to tell my children again what it was they were supposed to do? No, you don't wonder that because you know you needed to tell them again because they didn't get it the first time. And here, 2, 1 to 10, he worked in terms of age and gender about specific things. But here in 3, 1 to 2, he specifically addresses how Christians live engaging the broader world. Now, when he talks about being courteous, for example, he's not saying be, be courteous to unbelievers and it doesn't matter how you behave with believers, of course. He's not drawing that distinction. But there is more of a focus on our engagement with the outside world. So this text, in a way is very similar to the early part of chapter 2, is making the point that we are not simply of this world. The Cretans have a certain culture. We've seen that. It's a pretty messed up culture. Coarse, rude, and harsh. And Paula said we ought not be like that. So this text is telling us again that we're not just to live any way we please. We are to be living in a way that is shaped by the gospel. And we don't get to make that up on our own. So when we think about our behavior, our attitudes, it will not do to say, this is what everybody does. This is just the way I am. The Bible is saying to us, quit being just the way you are and start being more like Christ. We tend, every one of us, to judge or discern ourselves and our behavior based on what's around us. And that's not always very helpful, especially if we understand we live in a fallen world. We can look at some folks around us and say, well, I'm doing pretty good. But what the Bible is always telling us to do is we live in light of the holiness of God. This is why in 1 Peter, quoting from Isaiah, it will say, God will say, be holy as I am holy. But one of our real challenges in the world today for the church has to do with failures in the realm of Christian ethics. We need to come back again to say, how should I live? Not just looking at what's around me, not just picking up ideas out of media, but what does God really say? Understanding that we are supposed to be a distinct group, a group that doesn't judge itself based on what's going on around us, but says, what does God say? And a group that is prepared for people to say, that's weird. And we should, if we understand our Bibles, be ready to say, thank you. Now, I'm talking about a gospel weirdness. We all have our own temptations, other kind of weirdness that we don't need to blame on Jesus. I'm not talking about that. But we should expect to stand out and be different. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, one of his key lines, do not 
be like them. And yet one of the things we hear around us a lot is, how can we be more like them in order to reach them? That's wrongheaded. It's the difference that makes a difference. It's the difference in how we live that may make us stand out, may make us seem weird. Then when we say we have a message that God has spoken, has called upon us to give, then there is some reason to listen. If we act and look just like them, why should they bother? So that's where this text comes from. This is what it is calling us to. And if we asked these little points here in these two verses, you know, why should we live a certain way? Well, in this text, first of all, we should live this way because God's telling us to, right? That's, that's good enough. Secondly, he says it's because of the gospel. We've been talking about that. But third, in the whole flow of the letter, it seems to be suggesting, it's not stated explicitly, but it seems to be suggesting that this manner of living is what will open doors for us to tell people about Jesus, for them to see that it does make a valuable difference in our lives. So we have here seven specific things we're supposed to do. I've had a, a couple of people who like to point out and, and ask questions when uh, the sermon is prepared to have 10 verses or 15 or 20. So I was looking for the opportunity today to say, only two, only two. But there are seven commands in the two, so there we go. So, Paul says to Titus, before he even gets to those seven commands that I'll list in just a minute, he first says, remind them. Now, as I've been doing as we go through here, I often if there's in the text a point about pastoral ministry, I pause and just make it. So let me make this one here. As Titus is leading the church in Crete, Paul tells him, remind them to be seven things, but remind them. These are things they know, and for us today, I don't imagine that anything in this list is going to be brand new to you. Maybe we can see it afresh, understand it anew, but none of it's brand new. One of the most important tasks of a pastor is to remind us again and again. God's not giving new revelation. If we've been a Christian for some time, we have probably heard most of the key things of the scriptures. There's always those things we've missed, but we do not gather to be told brand new things. We gather to be reminded of those truths that we're tempted to forget, of those truths that we're tempted to find a way around. And even as we've had our update this morning, that's what we're looking for. Someone who doesn't chase novelty or trying to tickle ears but brings us back to these central truths. That's what Titus is to do. So he's to remind us of seven things. Let me just list them. You see them there. Uh, but these words uh, are kind of unique in certain places, so translations will vary. But to be submissive to rulers and authorities, there's our first one. To be obedient, second. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. These seven things, describing Christian living. So let's take them up, each in turn. I'm going to put the submit to rulers and authorities and obey together. Because there in the context it's implied, submit to rulers and authorities, and then to be obedient, to be obedient to whom? Proper rulers and authorities. Now it's interesting it's slightly different words, but since we have submit and obey authorities, that's the same two words in Hebrews 13, 17, a text that we looked at back in the fall. And I know as soon as I said those, y'all all said, right, that's what he preached on Hebrews 13, 17 several months ago. Here are these same things. Now, though, he's talking about authorities, rulers in government is how we would say it. That shouldn't be a great surprise to us that the Bible says this here. It says it in several places. And as soon as we hear submit and obey to governmental authorities, we may kind of right away say, but there's a limit to that. And you're absolutely right. But before we run to the limits and exceptions, 
let's set with what this actually says for just a minute. Particularly here in the context. If we want to live lives that affirm the gospel, then we need to be people whose natural bent, or shall I say supernatural bent, is towards being obedient and submissive to proper authorities. Now, just to help us take that in, let me read to you the two other key New Testament texts on this point. One of them is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Or the other key text on this, which is Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God according or attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Three texts very strong on this point. And I hope you heard in the First Peter text when he's talking about being submissive to rulers and authorities, he moves on to talking about doing what is good, which is the very thing that's in this text as well. So what does that look like for us? We've talked about this a little bit along the way, but it means that we should be people who are looking for every way to live in obedience to the authority around us, knowing there's a limit, but being faithful in every degree that we can to live under the governing authorities. Now, again, you may have heard some of those texts that it says uh, in First Peter, he's God's servant to, to uh, judge those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Romans 13, a similar point. You don't want to be afraid? Then do what's right, and uh, those in authority will praise you. And any of us can think of situations where that hasn't gone that way. We are in a fallen world, and government authorities don't always do what it is they're supposed to do. They're not always believers. And someone might say, you know, that's all fine and good. The Bible kind of ivory tower. Paul apparently thinks about Christian leaders, and uh, wouldn't it be great if all of our government authorities were Christian, and then we could obey these things? You realize who was most likely emperor when Paul wrote that, right? Nero, the guy who ends up persecuting the church. So he's not writing in an ivory tower. He's not writing in a situation where everything was going right. He's actually writing in a situation that makes anything we see pale in comparison. He is saying something challenging, and that ought not be a surprise. So we need to be thinking, how is it that we can live in this way? We need to understand and we need to beware of the fact of how media, voices around us, shapes our affections. 
in our setting, we are pulled toward liking the rebel. And we are pulled toward looking down on those rule followers. Why are they always just doing what they're told? Kind of the bad boy picture, that's the great thing. That's not a healthy gospel way to think. In fact, over in 1 Samuel, you can check it out in chapter 15, verse 23, where he says, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. And yet we do kind of see the, yeah, I want to be a rebel. You can kind of get away with that. In fact, there was a Christian album not too long ago that maybe had a song by that name and I cringed. I appreciate the guy, but I cringed. I, I, you might even see t-shirts for a youth camp, not here, but that say, let's be rebels for Jesus. Nobody's printing t-shirts that say, let's be witches for Jesus. I think we have underestimated how bad a rebellious spirit is. And by the way, this is one reason if you really look into the 1700s in American history, you find pastors and theologians at pains to point out that they are not being rebels, but are actually seeking to uphold the law, which is over the king. Now, that's a whole other issue in history, but just kind of making the point, we've kind of bought an idea that to be a rebel is a good thing. It's not. It is distorting and warping to your soul, and we need to work against it. So, kids, children, I got a hunch that rebellion's not a popular thing in your home. I hope not. But we can kind of still there, kind of take on the thing of, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. One way you start walking in the way of Christ is by being carefully obedient to your parents. When I talk to a child who's interested in baptism and we're trying to discern the work of grace in their heart, one of the main conversations I want to have is, what does it look like in obedience to parents? This is the work of grace. It doesn't just stop with children, though. He says rulers and authorities. As he goes on, we can see that it has to do with government, but he's really talking about any proper authority. What does that look like in the way that we respond to authorities at our work? What about teachers at school or principals? What about coaches? What about the laws of the land? We don't do a good job teaching children to obey if they keep seeing us try to find ways to skirt around laws. We don't help at all if we support a child's rebellion against a coach. That's gotten to be very popular around us. God is telling us that we need to be people who have a submissive spirit, who are happy to live under proper authority because God has structured an authoritative world. Now, again, a popular thing in our culture is to say really that there is no authority. Everything's all the same. Uh, we're all the same. We're all the same in the fact that we're all made in the image of God. But if you begin to try to level any kind of authority structure, you're now work, doing the work of the devil and not the work of God. God has instituted authority structures. And they need to operate well. And it's a fallen world and they don't always. But this is the way God has made the world. There's really no place in Christian living, in the church, for the spirit of anarchy. For the spirit that says, we don't like what's going on, so let's just destroy it all, and maybe something good will come out of it. That's folly. So what we must do, even as we see error in places and sin in places, is submitting to proper authority, then speaking truth and looking for change. So we need to think about this a bit. We do recognize that in essence, if you summarize the Christian teaching, it is number one, as far as how we live, number one, obey God. Number two, obey proper human authority so long as that does not violate number one. That's not that complicated. But it's not throw off human authority if they don't do what I like, 
or something like that. Yes, there is a place where we get to from Acts 5, we must obey God rather than man. But let's live in such a way that when that time comes, the watching world says, wow, those people, they tend to be ready to live under proper authority. And if they're bothered, that's odd, rather than, yep, figures, there they go again. Gospel-shaped living includes being submissive to rulers and authorities and being obedient. Then he goes to his third point. To be ready for every good deed. To be prepared for every good work. This is the idea. And that ready, prepared, that's quite an image. I picture it as being poised, suited up and ready for any good deed that comes along. Now, we need to have in our minds, because there's a lot of repetition of words in this letter, back chapter 1, verse 16, the bad guys. The last thing said about them was that they were unfit for any good deed, being defiled, detestable, and disobedient. They're unfit for any good deed. We should be ready for any good deed. The idea is eagerness and readiness. Those false teachers seem to be unfit for any good deed because they're so self-centered. That's one thing that will keep you and me from being ready for any good deed. Because selfishness does not produce good deeds. Selfishness sees needs in others and says, yeah, well, I got needs too. Somebody might even suggest, hey, there's a need. You might could fill it. Well, do you know my needs? Who's filling them? But remember, we are these people in the latter part of this chapter who have seen the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appear. When we were foolish and disobedient and enslaved to our sins, God has lavished his grace upon us. If we have received that, then we recognize this undeserved grace toward us. We become those people who are looking for the opportunities to bless. Folks who wake up wondering, how is it that I might do good help, serve, minister, relieve, bless, just looking for any opportunity. The kind of people, you know, that you might get warned about. Watch out for him, watch out for her. If they got the slightest opportunity, they'll do something good for you. That kind of person. That's what we should be. Not waiting to be told, not needing to be pressed, not needing to be or have our arms twisted, but eager and ready to do good in any way. So let's think about that again. Kids at home, easy way to do this. Set your mind, look at your home, and just ask, what can I do that I'm not already asked to do? You're already asked to do it, kind of doesn't count. You need to go ahead and do that. What can I do that I'm not already asked to do that, that would help our family, would help our home. You know, I notice that this isn't getting done, and, and I could do that. Uh, I see this here, and mom, dad, could, could I do that? Could I help with that? This, again, is the work of grace. It's true for us adults in our homes. It's true with your spouse. It's true at work. It's true in the church. Now, we'll have announcements at the church that says, hey, we have a need here, because we understand, can't always see what the needs are, right? So again, let me go back to relationships. Don't twist what I'm saying so that you end up the person who says, well, I thought you'd be eager and ready to serve. I didn't think I needed to say what my needs were. I thought you'd just know. That's wicked. We don't do that. When we have needs, we need to properly, graciously seek to make them known. When we hear of needs, we need to be ready to step in as best we can and meet them. And then we need to be a community who is watching and looking for needs that may not have even been noticed yet. If you've walked alongside with people, with friends at any length of time, you have been going along and you've seen somebody struggling or, or missing something that you knew you could just step in and help. You didn't have to wait to be asked. 
Now, don't, don't go sell somebody's car because you think they could do that without asking them or something like that. But you can step in and bless and help and serve and encourage and build up all of those things. And one of the great things about this phrase is it's pretty clearly focused on what we would probably think of as smaller things. Again, I've talked about this in some other messages, but I think we're addicted to big things. We want to do great things for God, and you may get a chance, and there's nothing wrong with it, but you will not be ready to do great things for God until you're just living daily doing the mundane things for God. We might be the person who say, well, you know what? If I had a lot of money, I would give and make this happen. Well, you don't. But I bet you underestimate the impact and the value of simply coming alongside someone to say, hey, I noticed how you care and serve. That's far more meaningful than you may realize. Or, hey, there's this small thing maybe that you did for me, and it has meant so much to me, and I realize I never told you that. Let me just tell you that. Those words of encouragement and help across human history have meant much. Perhaps they're even more valuable today in a very loud and noisy and self-centered world where we don't hear very well to just hear and bless. This again is what grace works in us, to be attentive to people. As a church, we should have a goal that no need goes unmet. Again, when we looked at Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, there's some language there, but if we're eager, ready to do any good deed, we should especially be watching over our congregation of saying, who can I bless? How can I help? Where is a need? We're not going to see that unless we watch one another and are attentive to one another and we listen. If all we do is show up on Sunday and then go our ways, we're not going to be able to do that. But if we're going to be the community of Christ, then we can. So, let us be prepared for every good work. His fourth point, he tells us to speak evil of no one. That's how the ESV translates it. Other translations say slander no one. That gets the point well here too. One writer said this, It's not only a cretin, but a human tendency to grouse, malign, complain, and commit other acts of verbal aggression, whether directly or behind others' backs. So where he was telling us to do something positive, do good, he now warns us against the negative. Don't speak evil of anyone. And if there is a particularly common sin in our culture, I'm going to suggest it's probably slander. And we have devised and our great technological prowess, a more effective way to speak evil of people than ever before in human history. You see, in the past, you would have to talk to a human being in order to talk evil about somebody. I mean, you could go behind their back, but you still got to talk to another human being. But now, now all you have to do is log on with your computer, and you can tell the world without the embarrassment of having to face anybody. I've heard others say something like this, but I'm convinced that a lot of things that are said that are attacking or whatever else would not be said if the person typing had to look the person in the face. Somehow it seems that when we hear all this, this Bible teaching about our words, our mouths, our lips, our tongues, we fail to understand that it also has to do with your fingers when you're typing. Slander no one. Well, what's that word there for no one? It's a word that means no one, not any. I can't slander anybody? No. And I think I've alluded to this, but I have heard that in the Middle Ages, when they were, uh, had gunpowder and they're starting to put it together, 
They normally used a round musket ball, but some devised a cube musket ball that presumably caused more pain, but it was unlawful to use that against fellow Christians. You had to kill fellow Christians with a round ball. But you could use the square one, which was more painful, against heretics. No. We're not supposed to slander anyone. But what about this false teacher? You may need to call out error, but don't slander. What about this person who slandered me? Probably even when you ask it, you can hear Jesus' teaching. That when you're reviled, you do not revile in return. No, we're not supposed to slander at all. The Bible says a lot about the work of grace shaping our language. All over the scriptures. The book of James, particularly. Talking about how the tongue is a, a fire full of evil. Grace would teach us to rein this in. It doesn't mean, again, that we don't speak against wrong. The life of the Christian still involves the labor. We're still told to rebuke. Titus was told to do that in chapter 2, verse 15. Yes, to rebuke, but not to slander. You can go to someone. In fact, sometimes you're required to go to someone and say, brother, sister, that's wrong. We don't need to do that. And this needs to change. But you don't go to somebody else and say, don't you think they ought to change? Can you believe what on earth they're doing? It's got to shape our speech. And when it doesn't, it leads to quarreling, which is his fifth one. The ESV has avoid quarreling. Some of your other translations, avoid fighting, be peaceable. It is a word that is the word uh, uh, fighting or, or disputes, and it has a letter on the front of it, kind of like un. We put on the front of something to negate it. And it was used before the New Testament in secular settings, in military talk, talking about somebody who wasn't willing to fight. It was used negatively there. Here it's used positively to talk about the person who isn't easily stirred to anger. The person, as we say sometimes, with a long fuse. And as I thought about this, and I tried to think about how do we shape our minds here and how does the world around us tend to push us to wrong things? Because the way we think about all this is shaped by stories and songs and things. And quite frankly, I thought about some of the old westerns. It was one of the standard tropes for the hero there. He's a guy, he doesn't, he's not picking a fight. He's not looking to cause trouble. Folks poke on him and poke on him and he just tries to be peaceable. But there's a time when you have to stand for truth. And then they all wish they hadn't, hadn't messed with him. That's the picture here. But the culture around us tells us, hey, if you're going to be somebody, and often, if you're going to be manly, you've got to be the person that says, I don't take nothing off nobody. Not even a grammar book. But that's not it. We really should be people who take quite a bit. Now, we speak, we can say, this is inappropriate, don't do this, but we don't fly off our handles. We're patient. And this is what even, let me take up the fifth thing here, this avoid quarreling here that he goes on, I'm sorry, he goes on to be gentle and kind. These letters, these words come together, of long-suffering, this patience, this picture we see in Jesus of bearing with things. You understand, of course, this is the only way any relationship, marriage, congregation, anything else can ever persevere with sinful people is that we are long-suffering and patient and against the gospel that's working this in us. Even as we say to a spouse, a child, a co-worker, a friend, when are you ever going to quit doing this? When are you ever going to learn? And we may hear as it were, an echo coming back to us, wondering what the Lord would be tempted to say to us if he were more like us. You mean you're coming to confess the same sin again? What's up with you? As people who have received patient blessing, we must be those who are patient in return. Now again, the picture here is not 
that we just acquiesce to evil, that we just push overs or whatever else. We speak. We don't allow evil to go on. Particularly, we don't allow evil to go on with others. And eventually, we have to say we don't allow evil to go on with us. We must speak for truth. We must defend truth and all those things. But we're not people who fly off the handle. We're patient with it. We deal with things when we need to. But we should be such a person. And again, when people say, if he said enough, if she said that's gone too far, it really must be because that's a patient person. And he wraps it all up there with the last one, telling us to show perfect courtesy to all people. And this is translated different ways. Meekness, gentleness, being gentle, because these all overlap. And the the idea here is really of somebody who's not caught up with their own self-importance. And therefore, they can show courtesy to others. Pride is often at the center of our selfishness which is what's contrary to all of this. In fact, when we have to keep grasping and pointing out and trying to make sure that everybody knows we're right, that's usually a result of insecurity and pride. But as people who have been redeemed, who have been freed from our sins, then we should be able to be magnanimous. We know that the Lord's way wins in the end. We know that we are redeemed in his sight. And if others think differently, we can rest in him, and therefore we can have this kind of attitude to others. Now the ESV does say perfect courtesy to all people. That's an effort to translate the word is all there. All courtesy to all people. As one person said, there's to be no limit either to our humble courtesy or to the people to whom we show it. All courtesy to all people. And you know, it's a lot easier to be courteous or gentle with some people than it is others. But he didn't give us any escape hatch here either. This is difficult. But that's why he moves into the gospel to say, this is why we do this. If we have come to know Christ, if his spirit is at work within us, this kind of thinking and living should be boiling up within us. We need to sit with these commands long enough to let them seep down into our souls so that they come back up shaping our affections and desires and therefore guiding our behavior. That's why we need to sit with these things and knowing what it is that we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live. So, we're going to have a time of response. And we may need simply to sing We're singing a great song about being committed to our oneness. You may need to talk to the Lord where you are. The Lord may have convicted you about a specific one of these. You may want to come and pray. You may want to come and talk to one of the pastors. It's also possible that even as we've gone through these, and I've pointed out this is the power of the gospel at work in you, you may say, I don't think really the power of the gospel is at work within me. I have not trusted Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Trust him, even where you are. You don't have to come down here to trust him. Trust him there. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ. And we would be happy to talk with you more about that as well. So let me ask you to bow your heads. To consider God's word this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for your redeeming power. Thank you for your patience with us. And thank you that you don't simply save us and then just leave us to do our own thing but you guide us into the kind of living which leads to real satisfaction and joy with one another help us then in that way and move amongst us we ask in jesus name amen